Okay, I have made a video on pulmonary, pulmonary edema in past, but I recently came across a wonderful site that has some very good examples. Luckily, I also have been given permission to use images from this wonderful site. So once again, two chest x-rays. The one on your right hand side is normal. You can see both lungs are of normal volume. Hemidiaphragms have usual shape like a dome on each side normal cardiomediastinal contours. You can clearly see right and left heart borders. Both lungs are well aerated, means full of air which appears black on chest x-ray. Normal vascular pattern is visible. There is no sign of collapse or consolidation. No pneumothorax is identified. There is no pleural effusion on either side and there's no sign of lymphadenopathy. Trachea is not deviated to any side with the exception of slight deviation in the distal part because of arch of aorta which is totally normal. Cardiac size is normal, visually less than or equal to the size of one hemidiaphragm or you can be accurate and can actually measure cardiothoracic ratio. You can clearly see gradually tapering blood vessels which become smaller and, and smaller as they move from hilum and eventually disappear towards the periphery. They become so small that they do not remain visible in subdural areas. All blood vessels that are visible have sharp outlines. The gastric bubble is visible on left side as usual. There is no free air under diaphragms. There is no sign of pleural abnormalities either on either side. No abnormal calcification is seen within lungs or in thoracic cavity otherwise. Visible thoracic cage and other bones are normal. Angle of carina is less than 90 degrees. In fact, it is much less than that. Vascular pedicle width is also normal. The vascular pedicle width is measured by creating a vertical line from where the left subclavian artery leaves aortic arch and measuring across to a point at which superior vena cava crosses the right main bronchus. It should be between 4 to 6 cm. Again, as you see more x-rays, you'll be able to visually tell whether it is normal or not. Vascular pedicle width can be indicative of pulmonary edema and can help differentiate its forms. On the x-ray on your left hand side, you should instantly note that there is a significant increase in linear markings. Vessels have lost their definition too. You cannot clearly see their borders. Lungs do not appear to have usual lucency that they should have. The x-ray shows increased vascular pedicle width which we just learned can not only be indicative of pulmonary edema but can also be helpful in differentiating among different forms. There is some blunting of claustrophrenic angle indicating the presence of pleural effusion, the horizontal or minor fissure as it is known as is quite prominent. Her is a bit enlarged but one of the most important diagnostic features is the presence of these sub pleural lines that are predominantly visible in lateral basal area these horizontal lines that are visible in sub pleural areas and unlike blood vessels are horizontal as you trace them medially they disappear. These lines are actually known as curly B lines. They were first described by Dr. Peter Curley, an Irish radiologist and hence are named after him. These lines are classical features of pulmonary edema and in fact are edematous interlobular septal lines. The x-ray is a very classical example of pulmonary edema and to be very precise this is pulmonary interstitial edema. So once again the features that support the diagnosis of pulmonary interstitial edema in this particular case are curly B lines, cardiomegaly, increased linear markings, loss of vascular definition, increased vascular pedicle width and pleural effusion. 
you can have pulmonary edema without cardiomegaly and there can be other features and we'll discuss them shortly. There are many causes of pulmonary edema including non-cardiogenic ones but in hospitals you'll frequently see pulmonary edema that is classified as cardiogenic. In such cases it is caused when left ventricle or left atrium fails to pump blood effectively to its next destination. It can be because of a certain heart attack, for example, or because of a chronic process such as mitral valve stenosis. Whatever may be the cause, the end result is the imbalance in blood volume flowing in and out of heart. This causes back pressure, which is transmitted back to pulmonary venous system which is a network of blood vessels that drain oxygenated blood from lungs to left atrium. As a result pulmonary veins become congested and dilated with blood. There is only so much they can hold. The increased pulmonary venous pressure results in seepage of plasma fluid first into the interstitium of lungs. It is then classified as pulmonary interstitial edema such as one which was visible on the x-ray that we just saw. The fluid can eventually leak into alveoli. It is then classified as alveolar edema. The slide shows secondary pulmonary lobules outlined by interlobular septa. Make a note of this fibrotic septa. This is not a normal image. So these are secondary pulmonary lobules. These are intralobular septal lines. These are interlobular septal lines. They have veins and lymphatics and you can see red are the lymphatics and these are actually bronchovascular bundles. They carry bron uh, bronchial branches as well as pulmonary arteries. So these lines when they get filled with fluid become visible as curly B lines, horizontal lines that run from pleural surface towards the hilum, horizontal lines that become invisible as they move as, as, they, as you try to trace them towards the hilum or mediastinum. And as I said, interlobular septal lines are actually composed of connective tissue and contains a small pulmonary veins and lymphatics. Curly B lines are actually fluid filled interlobular septal lines that become visible as sub pleural horizontal lines. The lymphatics, as they move towards the hilum, become fused in bronchovascular bundles and become hard to see. Notice the fluid is actually leaked from pulmonary veins, but pulmonary arteries have also become hazy and have lost their definition. It is because the presence of excess fluid within bronchovascular interstitium, lymphatics trying to access, uh, trying to drain excess fluid. Bronchovascular bundles actually contain bronchi and pulmonary arteries and are enclosed by a sheath of connective tissue called bronchovascular interstitium. And the reason curly B lines become first visible in the, and, and are more prominent in lung bases is that the hydrostatic pressure in capillaries in upper parts of the lungs is lower as compared to dependent parts of the lungs. The next slide shows three histology images to indicate what happens microscopically. In the top right hand corner you can see an image showing normal alveoli. These are normal alveoli. Notice they are thin walls that provide an ideal environment for gas exchange. You can clearly see type 1, these are type 1, and type 2 pneumocytes. Notice how thin alveolar septa are. The image on your top left hand side is from a patient with pulmonary edema. You can see congested and thickened alveolar septa, a huge number of red blood cells or clearly visible. Alveoli can be seen filled with pinkish eosinophilic fluid which has leaked into the interstitium and eventually into the alveoli. You can see alveolar air spaces are filled with fluid so it becomes impossible for alveoli to allow gas exchange. This slide shows a normal image on your right hand side and an image with pulmonary edema with pulmonary interstitial edema showing not only curly B lines but also curly A and curly C lines as well. Note the pacing 
wire from a pacemaker and also external sutures indicating a history of cardiothoracic surgery. Notice loss of vascular definition as compared to what is visible here. Okay, this is before and after image just to show you the difference in actual fact. The image on your left hand side also shows some degree of upper lobe diversion of blood if I'm not wrong. A close up of right hilum two images the one on your left hand side is normal. Notice how clear the outline of blood vessel is as compared to the image on your right hand side. This image also shows what is known as peribronchial cuffing. So if you can see uh, this is an end on a bronchus which is quite thick wall as compared to very thin wall over here. I don't know if you can see it or not but this is a very thin wall uh, bronchus as compared to quite thick wall bronchus over here and the same is true for this small one here and this small one here this area the images are example of when the plasma fluid actually has gone into alveoli so from because of the cardiac failure the fluid plasma fluid actually went from a small venous system into the interstitium of lungs and then and then from interstitium to the alveoli of lungs and you can see some air containing bronchi on both sides so the interesting thing here this represents a chronic process so the cardiac size is enlarged vascular particle width is quite big over here notice the the heart is not enlarged so which indicates it is most probably an acute process Notice the presence of calcification in aorta. So most probably coronary arteries also have calcification, atherosclerosis, and this is a sudden heart attack where this one is probably a chronic process. Another example of uh, pulmonary edema. Uh, in fact, pulmonary alveolar edema when the fluid actually has gone from within the interstitium into the alveoli, you can see Air bronchogram is quite nicely visible here. You can also notice intra aortic balloon pump. So, uh, this balloon pump has been inserted to help her to pump the blood. You can also see an endotracheal tube. So, patient is on artificial breathing, quite sick. And these are ECG lines, and there are some other lines as well. Cardiogenic pulmonary edema is usually treated with the combination of oxygen, diuretics, nitrates, uh, morphine, dopamine, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, beta blockers, etc. etc. Thank you very much.